What is going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel and to another Overwatch League discussion video. In today's discussion, I wanted to go over some of the things I noticed about observing the first week of the 2019 playoffs. Like with the previous episodes of the series, I would like to go over some of the general things I took a mental note of after watching the first initial wave of games in a new section of the season. I plan to go over some things I noticed in terms of the meta, teams, and some players. And that's basically a rundown of what to expect today, so without wasting any more time, let's get started. Okay, so starting off with the meta, I think most of us knew it would revolve around Sigma somehow, so there's no surprise there, and seeing him get paired up with Orisa isn't much of a shocker either since Double Barrier is so powerful. But there's also been some D.Va and even a little bit of Winston here and there, but more than anything it is Orisa Sigma. As for the DPS, seeing a fair amount of Doomfist was to be expected since he's arguably the best DPS to play against Sigma and just Double Barrier in general it feels like. The other DPS that seemed to get a fair amount of playtime based off of what I saw was Pharah, Symmetra, Reaper, May, and McCree. We also saw some others like Widow, Junkrat, and even Ash, but not to the degree of the other heroes I named before them. And for the supports, it's primarily Moira or Ana with Lucio or Mercy, depending on the comp, but there also has been some Baptiste added into the mix here and there, if I remember correctly. In my opinion, I feel that having a good Doomfist player is going to be crucial in the current meta. I get the feeling that a majority of the teams who play well on that hero will be the ones to go far in the playoffs. So long as nobody else on their team throws or gets completely outplayed, strong Doomfist play is what will likely keep most teams relevant. Having someone who is serviceable on Sigma won't hurt either. I'm not going to lie though, the meta itself seems like it could get kind of boring from a gameplay stance quickly, but I still find it to be pretty interesting. Unlike previous metas, it kind of feels like no two teams have the same playstyle. Based off what I saw from the six teams that participated in the play-ins, everybody seemed to have their own twist and take on how to play in this new meta. I don't know if it's just me, but every team so far seemed to differ stylistically at least a little bit. Let's do a quick rundown of what the teams were doing. So first, when looking at the Hunters, they played some Wrecking Ball and Junkrat and their loss to the Charge, and nobody else has done anything like that so far other than them. Then there's the Charge, who like to play a comp based off of what their opponents were running. In their game against the Hunters, they countered Jimbo's Pharah by putting Nero on a Pharah of his own. But in their loss to the Dynasty, they played a lot less Pharah and more Reaper in response to Fleta. Then of course, there's the fact that they played a small amount of Ash on Horizon Lunar Colony, which nobody else did. The Dragons decided to rock out with a little bit of everything. They did a decent amount of swapping with the rotation by having Youngjin usually play Doomfist, but then have Ding and Deom both split some playtime, which resulted in Shanghai having two different kinds of styles. If they wanted Widow, McCree, or Symmetra, they'd play Deom, but if they felt it was necessary to use a lot of Pharah and or Sombra, then Ding was their guy. This rotation allowed for Shanghai to give the fusion and Spitfire all they could handle. And how about the fusion? Their approach in their match against Shanghai was kind of unexpected, and nobody else did anything like it. Instead of putting Carpe on McCree and Widow to match Deom, or having EQO play Pharah, the fusion instead opted to run them on Reaper and May respectively. That resulted in this kind of hybrid lineup of what's meta now and what was meta in stage 4. They stubbornly stuck with that Reaper and May that nobody else was using in the tournament while also running the typical Orisa, Sigma, Moira, and Lucio. Oh, and as a quick side note, Poco Sigma was really solid. Him and Hoppo were the two standouts on that hero for me so far. It's a shame that Philly and Guangzhou are both out now. Then of course when looking at a team like the Dynasty, they seem to not want to play Pharah even though Fleta is so good at her. Sol seems more interested in putting Fleta on heroes that can shut down enemy DPS while Fitz does his job on the Doomfist. Take how he played against Nero for an example. Instead of opting into the Pharah battle like Jinmu did, he played McCree to pressure Nero and force him to swap. The McCree can also help slow down Eileen on Doomfist because of the extra crowd control you get from the flashbang, and when Sol got Nero to swap off Pharah, Fleta would just play Reaper and roll everybody. Forcing Nero off his comfort picks proved to be a very effective strategy, as he couldn't seem to keep up with Fleta if he had to match him with a Reaper of his own. The Dynasty pretty much made Nero a non-factor with how well they shut him down. Poor Eileen tried his best to compensate, but it wasn't enough. Definitely look to see if Sol invests a lot in counterplay again. That could very well be how they approach every game from here on out. One other cool thing that Sol did was have Marvel play Sigma. Only one other team from the planes had their main tank on Sigma, which was of course the London Spitfire. I kind of like how Sigma isn't being used by one specific class of players. The fact that both main tanks and off tanks are using him makes him feel kind of special, I feel. And in turn, this also means the same for Orisa in a way. Both Fury and Michelle were the ones to play her, while Marvel and Jester were on Sigma duty. That is definitely something to look out for with the six remaining teams who have yet to participate in a playoff game. Will more teams follow the norm of having the off tank play Sigma, or will we see other main tanks step up to the plate instead? And who knows, maybe a DPS player like Hydration could play him too. 
Thinking about all these possibilities is really exciting. But anyway, let's address London finally. These guys were kind of all over the place with what they wanted to play. There was a lot of Arisa Sigma and that's basically what they played for the most part, but there were moments where they decided to look elsewhere, like take their point B defense on Hanamura against Shanghai for an example. They ran a pretty standard looking dive comp that consisted of Winston, Diva, and Tracer. But also, at the same time, another thing I noticed was that we also saw Bird, Ring, and Prophet kind of alternate on specific roles. They both played some Doomfist and McCree at some point, but Prophet also brought a solid Ferret and Tracer into the mix as well. Well, London seems to have taken a very balanced approach to how they want to play. Think about it. They ran comfort picks and comps, counter picks, and mirror comps. Oh, and speaking of profit, can we mention how literally nothing has changed with this guy? Even after a year, he is still the player London relies on in the clutch and is their main playmaker who bails them out of tough situations. He had multiple pop-off moments in that insane series against Shanghai, and I can't say I'm surprised because it's profit. In my opinion, he is one of the most clutch players in the history of Overwatch esports. As you can see from the play-ins, every team seems to have their own style and philosophy for how to play the game right now, and that's something I'm a really big fan of. Back when Goats was meta, you kind of just played the same seven heroes over and over again unless you were the dragons or hunters. The only variation you saw was how aggressive or passive each team was. The playoffs are a whole different ball game though. There's a lot of similarities with what teams have ran so far, but there are some differences in hero selection and playstyle for sure. And what's great is that there are still six teams who have yet to reveal to us how they intend to play and who will play what for them. As somebody who obsesses over this league, I think it's something to look forward to. I'm intrigued to see if any of these teams play in a similar manner to the ones from the plans, and at the same time, we could get a team that takes a different approach from what we've seen so far by playing a hero or maybe a comp that we haven't seen yet. For all we know, a team may be planning something completely different, kind of like Shanghai did in the Stage 3 playoffs. I also wanted to bring up how some of the teams have surprised me. Starting with Seoul, I did not think they would be this dominant. I thought they'd give the charge a challenge, but I never thought they'd beat them, let alone how badly they ended up crushing them. Maybe the charge were a little overrated in this meta, but at the same time, what I'm thinking is that maybe Seoul simply had the better game. They outplayed their opponents without a doubt, that much is certain. The Dynasty challenged Nero, and the charge couldn't seem to recover or adjust from it. And how about London? So much for being this crazy team that was supposedly looking really dominant using Sigma comms. Now there is a chance that Shanghai was really good. We can't rule that out since they played London very hard and won against the Fusion even though many were counting them out after their abysmal stage 4. Also, I don't know how true this is because it comes from Reddit, but from what I've heard, London actually thought Shanghai was a tougher challenge during scrims than teams like The Shock or NYXL, so that's something you have to keep in mind as well in case it's true. So maybe London is good, but Shanghai also is around their level, but even so, if you're the so-called dominant team, shouldn't you have won this playing game? a bit more easily, I just don't know anymore. The Spitfire could have had an off game for all I know, but just barely squeaking out a win so early on doesn't exactly inspire confidence, but even so, it's clear that London can still be clutch when it matters most. When playoffs roll around and the stakes are at their highest, they always seem to come through. And while I'm on the subject of the London-Shanghai game, can we talk about how insane it was? We got to witness the longest match in league history map-wise. This was the first time ever that a series had 8 games be played. This was a long and grueling match, but I have to admit that it was really good. That final tiebreaker on Ilios in particular was epic. Not only was it super close, but there were some incredibly clutch plays made by both sides. And shout out to London for overcoming their demons and winning on their worst map this year. Okay, now that I've discussed the meta and teams to a certain extent, how about we focus in on some of the standout players so far? Other than Hoppa, Poco, and Prophet, I think there were some other players who showed up in a big way. For one, the sole DPS duo of Fleta and Fitz looked really good. I already said that Fleta did a great job with counterplay, but it's not like that's all he was good for. The man popped off. He made some really nice plays on Reaper and McCree, but Fitz definitely deserves some attention too. His performance on Doomfist was inspirational. He had a very strong series. If you keep up with a prolific Doomfist player like Eileen stride for stride, then it's safe to say that you're doing something right. It's a little early to say right now, but he might be one of the best Doomfist players in the playoffs as it currently stands. If Fleta and Fitz can keep this level of play up, then I see no reason why Sol wouldn't be a legitimate title contender. Another standout player in my eyes was Badoshin. His Ana in particular was huge for London and was definitely a big reason why they won. I know Prophet was crazy good, I don't want to take anything away from him, but I kind of think Badoshin deserves a lot of credit too for that win. He hit some 6 leap darts and bionades that tended to get a lot of value. This was definitely one of the best games I've seen him play in a long time. Badoshin was kind of quiet this year, so seeing him wake up at such a crucial part of the season is a great sign if you're a London fan. He's hitting his stride right when it matters the most. 
I guess I should also say that I think Gesture and Marvel had some bright spots on Sigma too. I don't think they were constantly brilliant like Poco or Hoppa, but they definitely had their moments. I think Marvel was pretty well balanced overall. He didn't really do anything crazy impactful, but he got the job done for sure. Same can be said for Gesture, but he definitely needs to work on using his ult and getting more value off of it. There were far too many moments for my liking where he just completely whiffed it. But other than that, I can't really complain. I'm curious to see where Marvel and Gesture will rank amongst the other six Sigma players heading into the playoffs. Oh, and before I forget, big shout out to both Nero and Eileen. I think they had some crazy performances. I know that Nero didn't do great against Sol and he kind of got shut down, but nothing can take away that insane performance he had against the Hunters. I mean, it was historic. His Pharaoh was insane in that game. He outplayed Jinmu completely, and that is very impressive. And I already mentioned before when talking about Fitz that I think Eileen is a crazy good Doomfist player. I mean, he might be the best in the Overwatch League, maybe even the world for that matter. Needless to say, if you're a Charge fan, you should very much be looking forward to 2020. Your team is looking absolutely stupid stacked and they can only get better from here. So yeah, I think those are all of the players I wanted to bring up. Round one of the playoffs begin this Thursday and I could not be more psyched. There's so much to look forward to and it goes beyond what was mentioned in this video. The matchups in the first round look really good on paper. Expect me to talk about these matchups later in the week. With that said, that is going to wrap up today's discussion. So now it's your turn guys. Tell me what you noticed about the first week of the playoffs down in the comment section. And if you enjoyed this content, then I would appreciate it if you could like and subscribe. You can also further connect with me by following me on Twitter at ATP Overwatch watch and by joining my discord server through the link in the description. As always, thank you all so much for watching today's video. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is ATP signing out. Peace.